All right. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm James. Um, hi. I showed you some cool videos. Thank you. So who am I? Uh, I'm a hacker. I work on config management stuff. I write a technical blog called The Technical Blog of James. Who's seen it? Just raise your hand. Um, if you haven't, just raise your hand anyway so I seem really popular. Thank you. I reuse all my jokes. I'm actually a physiologist by training, so I used to do a lot of stuff on cardiology and sort of what I, my goal is really research and things like that. And really into DevOps. And I used to do a lot of stuff with uh, Puppet, and everything was a big trash fire and it was pretty terrible. And um, I didn't want to sort of reinvent new tools and reinvent the wheel if there were existing tools. But I didn't like this wheel. It was kind of a shitty wheel. I want the, like, the new shiny wheel. Um, and so I basically came and I was like, is there an existing tool or language that is good enough? This was the question that I was sort of asking myself. And what did you think? Anybody? No one wants to answer. That's okay. This guy will answer for me. He's my nope guy. I'm going to be sitting down a little bit so I can do some demos. So don't worry. I'm still here. Um, so yeah, there just wasn't really, sometimes you really need to build new things, and so that's the thing. So long story short, I sat down, I started working on this project called MGMT. We have a nice pretty logo that someone made. It's a DAG. Uh, it's a graph. Um, it has two main parts, so just a little bit intro. Who's seen MGMT stuff before? Anyone? Or are you all complete beginners? Okay, so we're going to go with some basics. Um, there's basically two parts. There's the engine and the language, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, both of them. So um, three main parts of the engine. There's, um, it can run stuff in parallel. So basically, you have this graph of resources, and it can run through the graph and run it in parallel. Everything's event-driven, which I'll show you. And it works as a distributed system. So this is basically a graph of resources that you would normally see in, in these sorts of declarative tools. And the blue box basically represent what happens in what order. And the black arrows are dependencies. So typically, you would run through, do a topological sort, and execute everything. But we actually run in parallel. And each of these boxes, in addition to being able to run when it's time, it also can respond to events and wake up and do stuff. So I'm just going to show you an example of that. Um, so um, here's just a little silly, silly example. So on the left, I'm going to run, on your left, I'm going to run MGMT. And on the right, uh, we have a folder. I think it's right here. And so I've basically asked MGMT to create one file. And you can see that it has like a little message. Is it big enough? Can everyone see? Yep. Yes? Cool. And, and the cool thing is I can actually like, remove this file. And if I do list, you can see it came right back. Because MGMT is noticing the state in real time of the machine. So it removes the file, and it comes right back. And I show this demo because it's quite fun. You can even, uh, sorry, you can even move the file and cat the file. And you can see even before the whole command runs, MGMT is waking up and doing this. So you keep the state in real time. And you can even do this sort of trick, which uh, with this little program called Watch, which will run something over and over again really, really quickly. And you can see as fast as you're running, it always is keeping the state in real time. Cool? Does that make sense? Yeah. You like that? Yeah. Okay, so this works for every resource, for files, packages, services, for AWS resources in some cloud thing, if you're into that kind of thing, virtual machines, uh, containers also, maybe that's your jam, um, all sorts of resources. And you can write a new resource, too, if you want. It's very simple. Um, ultimately... The, out of the, the output of the program is a DAG. So it's this graph, kind of like the logo that I showed you. And that says what we do. And uh, because this is the languages dev room, we're going to actually describe our language that produces this output. Because it turns out having a language is actually a very interesting way to describe exactly what we want over time. And that's what we're going through. Here's basically the quote that I've been thinking about for many years, ever since I heard it. Uh, basically, we want a language that's going to constrain us as much as possible, but also um, make it easy to express some very complicated things. And the reason is very simple. Because if you make an off by one error in your program, and your program controls a whole bunch of infrastructure, you don't want to nuke like three data centers, right? So responsible, safe DSLs. This guy's like, oh, I want to nuke my data center. If the responsible, safe languages that can describe these things are, are very powerful. So we want a language that's safe. Uh, in my case, uh, declarative, basically immutable in, I think, what you guys would call it. It's a functional typed language. Um, the implementation is written in a memory safe language, so it's not some C horror show. Uh, hopefully, it's very powerful, uh, so it's a reactive language that I'll show you about. And hopefully, that the language has some primitives that make, us e make it easy to understand what's going on. Am I talking way too fast? Just nod yes. Is everyone with me so far? Do you want to see another demo? I think it'll be more helpful. So here's the first demo. I just sort of pasted some code onto the slide. And the language um, 
I don't have proper syntax highlighting yet, so this is just me fooling around. Basically, you have uh, some stuff in the language. So here's a function date time. Um, here's some multiplication of a bunch of stuff. We put some values into a, stuck, uh, into a struct. There's a load function over here, which you might see. Um, and then there's some VU meter function. I don't know what that does. And basically, we print it all out um, into the contents of this file. Okay? So let me just actually run this. And we'll see what happens. So this is going to basically print, run a bunch of code, and then put the data in a file. But the thing is, this is an FRP, so it's a functional reactive language, which means the data has streams and goes through and actually will produce new values as needed. So for example, date time happens to produce a new value. Basically, it changes every second, because the date time in real life changes every second. And if we, we see this, we can actually run that little watch command we did before. But just I'm going to show you the output of that file, just so you see what happens. And this is basically all the text that this program ran and put out here. And you can see it's printing out in real time the number of seconds and some math to print out the date from now in one year. You can see it's printing out the actual system load. And all these values um, can be used to make decisions about what's happening. So based on when the load is up or down, you could do different things and model your infrastructure over time. Does that make sense? Yeah? So I even made, and this last thing here that you see changing is a little view meter. So just to show you how you can use any data source as input, I actually have my microphone listening right now on my laptop, and it's listening and sampling the sound, and the louder it gets, you can see that it changes in real time. Right? So if you make some noise, okay, so we'll be really quiet, and then you all make a whole bunch of noise, and we'll see if it works. Okay? Hey! Cool? So that sort of thing. So I mean, this is kind of silly, but imagine you wanted to model, like, in an absurd way, some, you know, data center where if there was a lot of noise and people were screaming, that maybe you like set everything real only for an hour till people cool off. You can model these sorts of decisions. That's kind of silly, but you can sort of uh, use your imagination. And again, this is very efficient, running in real time. Uh, I'll show you another demo. This is um, history histor uh, history demo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this code. Basically, I'm going to take the date time value, and then I'm going to use these curly brackets around each variable, 0, 1, 2, 3, and then just put all of that into the file with a big printf. So I'm just going to run this over here. And again, I, I always use the example of like running some data and putting it out to a file, because it's easy to show you what's going on. But instead of writing files on disk and text, <laughs> you could be actually creating virtual machines or doing other fancier things. So, um, this is just for example purposes. So you can actually see, if I'm running this, I'm just running this watch to constantly pull the file and see what's in it, we actually have the current date time and the previous value and the previous value before that and the previous value before that. Because since we have this time-based language, we can actually look back in the past and see what was the variable like five seconds ago or five values ago or so on. And with that, we can make decisions, right? If we see that the values are constantly going up or constantly going down or doing other, some sort of other pattern, we can make more intelligent decisions. All right? Does anyone know what this property is called, just for fun? It's OK. We're going to get to it. OK? Any, any quick, quick, quick questions so far? Is this cool? Yeah? Does anyone use like Puppet or Ansible or these sorts of tools? This is basically the kind of tool in that way. But um, we're doing all these things in real time and a lot faster. And, um, and way cooler, obviously. So that's a demo. Uh, you want to see some more demos? Oh, I think, uh, where's LibreOffice? All right. So this is a picture I took from my parents' house. Does anyone know what it is? It's a thermostat. Yeah, and you can see it's in the correct units of Celsius. Um, I have a simpler photo, which is I got from the internet, uh, in some sort of arbitrary, like, fascist units. I'm not sure what they are. Um, doesn't matter. The interesting thing is thermostats have an interesting property. What is that property called? Anyone? Hysteresis. hysteresis. You've seen my talk. That's great. Or maybe you knew. But that's okay. Hysteresis. So what is hysteresis? <laughs> Sounds complicated. It's not. It's basically sort of what I was telling you before. So thermostats, they want to respond uh, and heat the room or cool, or cool the room by turning themselves off, for example, or cooling. doesn't matter. And by looking at the previous values, they know what to do. So for example, if you're heating the room up and you hit 20 Celsius, you might want to stop. But if you're on the way down, you want to stay off until you come back to that value. So it basically gives us some history in the value to make a decision about whether we should go on or off. And it's quite useful to stop um, thermostats from flicking on and off. Because if the moment you got to 20 Celsius, you heat it up a tiny bit, it would instantly click off and then click back on, and it would just basically break your, your, your heater. So that's why this is very useful. 
So I'm going to show you a demo of this. Oops. Um, so my demo is, um, first what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this hysteresis demo. So I'm going to run this demo on the left. And I'm going to basically run this watch command. It's going to cat the output <coughs> of this text file. And I'm going to list the virtual machines running on this laptop. Okay, it's a kind of a crappy laptop, but I can show you what it's doing. And so I ran MGMT, and what it did is it started up two VMs, one and two. And um, these are just here that were all already there. And the start of the text file basically shows this threshold and this load average. So actually, I'm just going to show you the code for this. Um, all of this code, by the way, it's all in Git in this project. So you can actually just try these examples at home. We don't have syntax highlighting. I think if we, like, I forget how this works. Like, I think it's like... I think it looks sort of like, I don't remember how this works. But um, so uh, here's the text file with just the contents of a bunch of variables. We're doing a little simple hysteresis implementation right here. And we're basically declaring one VM and a second. And the hysteresis variable say, if there's a really high load, we're going to shut down one of the VMs and maybe move it somewhere else. And if the load is less, we'll keep it running. Okay? So you can imagine the VM is doing a lot of work on your machine. You have like 100 VMs packed in. And when the load gets too high overall, you might want to move some of them to some other host. Right? Make sense? Yes? All right. Don't be shy. So uh, what I'm going to do is, so I've set the threshold to 1.5 load units. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to go over here. And I'm just going to artificially create some load just to, so you can see what happens when we hit 1.5. We're just running some commands. When we get to 1.5, MGMT should... Uh, react and shut down one of those machines. Okay. Hopefully it doesn't crash. There's actually a small bug in this, but uh, in the libvirt library. But um, yeah, so we're going to just create a whole bunch of load. It is going up. Come on now, even more. Once it goes up. Oh my goodness. Guess we need to just. Okay, it's really going up now. So watch what happens when we hit 1.5. Did we get there? So the kernel actually only updates the load. Oh, there we go. So we hit 1.6. Now we're going to shut everything down. You saw how the VM shut down, right? So shut it down. Now remember, we have this hysteresis. I programmed a 10-second hysteresis. So after we go down below 1.5 for 10 seconds, it'll start it back up because we don't want to flop. So it just went down. So there we go. Going down, it's about... Five seconds right now. Four, three, two, one, and boom. Ten seconds later, it started it back up. You like that? Yeah. You can clap if you want. <laughs> All right. So, so that's the idea, right? We don't want, like, ten seconds is silly. We don't want the VMs flapping like crazy. But for a demo, I just made something simple. So the whole point is intelligently, in a very small safe DSL, describing what we want to happen at a data center scale or at whatever scale you want. And when you build in that logic, you don't have to respond to monitors and alerts and pages and things like that. You build in the logic of what should happen in real time. And at every second of the day, the system, if you program it, will know what to do and hopefully do it for you. Is that a good idea? It's the future. 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 OK, I'm going to shut this down. Does anyone have any really, really quick one second questions? Thank you. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, we can't really talk about that right now. But I can tell you how it works after if you want. That's a really good question. Um, I don't even, I'm so embarrassed that I actually know what that means. Um, you want to see, uh, we have five minutes left. I'm going to show you, uh, you want to see another demo? Or this is kind of cool. So I wanted to show a distributed scheduling demo. So I'm going to run this one. So for this one, um, schedule. So I'm basically going to run a whole bunch of MGMTs. I think this is the one that I wanted to show you. So I'm just going to run a whole bunch of MG MGMTs on the left. And I have to do this quite quickly. Um, how do I do that? I think they're creating files here. OK. So I'm just going to show you the output uh, on cat. So <clears throat> each MGMT uh, agent will cluster itself together. And just to make this easier, I'm just going to run them all on the same machine with a different fake host name. And what each one is going to do in the language is it's actually going to describe, hey, um, hi, I'm here. I'm going to generate some random value or anything it wants. In this case, there's actually a raft-based scheduler, so this cool distributed thing. And what actually will happen is we'll actually 
it'll ask the scheduler to pick um, some number of hosts out of the pool of available hosts. So is that five and then I have five minutes for questions? Yes. So that's ten. All right, cool. This gentleman here in the front was scaring me. I was like, what? It's not time. So um, I started up the first host. You can see it thinks that H1 and H2 should be scheduled. Let's start up a third one. Um, see what happens. So I've asked it to pick two hosts out of the available pool. And you can see they've all been told in a distributed way, I'm going to pick H1 and H2. But watch what happens if I kill H2. You're going to say, oh, H2 is dying, so that's old data. H1 and H3 are like, OK, we've got to pick someone else. There's only H3 available. Easy scheduling decision. Um, now you can watch if H2 comes back, Okay, it realized it's awake again. It sees that H3 was scheduled. It didn't flip to the H2 again. didn't flop back. Um, and same thing, you can kill H3, for example. And it will also come right back and die, show that. So this is actually, you can actually express this in basically a few lines of code. Looks like this. You run the scheduling function, and you'll get a stream of who is scheduled. So you can make decisions on, let's put some containers over here. Let's run some VMs. Um, and just to show you, it's actually kind of fun. If I start H3 again, and then I just forcefully kill H2, it just died because I unplugged it. it, there's actually a timeout. And once the timeout's at 10 seconds, I believe, it should flip over to H3 when it realizes that it's permanently dead. So I'll just flip. Yeah, boom. Uh, kind of subtle. It's a bit of a demo that I had to do kind of quickly. I'd like to spend more time on it. But all these scheduling things, all these distributed things, they can all be done with this language. You can express all sorts of fancy stuff. So if you're Google, you could spend like years working on this fancy like Kubernetes scheduler monolith, or you could build a nice FRP, express all the logic, and give everyone the pieces so they can build things how they want. Does that make sense? We'll just kill this really fast. Um, I have a few more slides that I wanted to show you. Some quick interesting properties for the people that are more on the hardcore side. So the engine and the language are actually two separate pieces. They're on the same binary and the same code base. There's a bit of a separation. So technically, if we had a compile time, if we had a runtime error in the language, which we actually aim to eliminate entirely, because um, it's kind of an FRP, then technically it shouldn't leave the engine part alone. It shouldn't cause a big problem. It's not perfect, but it's, um, it actually works. Uh, a fun thing about the language is the language itself is actually a graph. So um, in some of my early examples, I wrote code out of order. Now, you should not do this. That's insane if you do. But if you did do it, it's actually legal code. Because the streams of values, kind of like an Excel spreadsheet, doesn't matter which order they're in. It just flows through, and the uh, compiler will figure that out. Um, variables are immutable. So if you did something like x equals 5 and then x equals 6, this is a compile time error. So we stop all sorts of classes of bugs uh, in the compiler before we even run code to hopefully make things safer. Um, hysteresis I talked to you about. There's different kinds of hysteresis, and you can model these in the language because we have history about old values. Um, the um, really cool thing about all these reactive variables is we can model local reactive variables, but we can also, because MGMT is built on this distributed system using this RAF protocol, can actually look at other variables on other machines and even have like distributed state machines and machines coordinating to make decisions. So you can get really fancy, and this is really just the beginning. Um, in like 10 years, like everyone's going to be doing this. We've got to have to model things across things. So um, I didn't talk about the import and the modules, but that's a DAG, and that's some fun stuff. Um, I don't have another time for more demos, so you'll have to wait uh, for another day. Uh, some future work. There's still lots of stuff to do in the project. I think it's just on the borderline of being usable for like small production uses. Uh, a lot of things need to be improved. Uh, new functions in the standard library need to be implemented. Uh, new resources, especially like cloud type things, because those are kind of popular. Um, you could imagine like having cost um, of VMs per minute sort of in as data sources and dynamically moving your VMs around different parts of the world depending on the cost in real time. Right? So if the prices go up or down or if the latency is bad, you can think about all these things and building them. A bunch of other stuff. There's a few bugs and there's kind of some legacy code that was kind of crappy that I wrote that I need to rewrite. So that's, that's bad. But this is about you. How can you help? Uh, you can use this. Oops. You can use this, test this, patch it, share it, document it, start on GitHub if you're into that, uh, blog it, tweet it if you have Twitter, uh, discuss it, hack on it with your friends. Yeah? You like free software? I'm trying really hard. I left my job at this like somewhat cool tech company uh, to work on this stuff. And we need funding. It's really kind of unfortunate. I'm just living off my savings, and I want to do a good thing and not have a proprietary like open core model. So that's my goal. But we need funding or patches or both. So if you want to help out, uh, I have a Patreon. It's like, I don't know, just an idea. Um, if finding a hacker, 
It's very sexy. So if you want to feel sexy, do, do the good thing. Let's just recap. This is Arthur Benjamin putting the cap back on his pen. It's a recapping joke. It's not very good. Um, if you're on IRC, uh, everyone here is on IRC, right? Yes? Uh, we have an IRC channel or a whole bunch of people just hanging out. Um, we have a Twitter account. Uh, there's a mailing list that Red Hat hosts for me. Oh my goodness, is it time to wake up? Jeez, it's a loud rooster if you cannot hear. Um, if you want to learn more, so there's the technical blog of James. You all know about it by now, purpleidea.com. Very cool. Uh, there's the GitHub project. There's some old videos online as well as on the GitHub page. You can find old recordings of different talks. Um, a whole bunch of articles I've written about MGMT are there. Uh, I'm Purple ID on IRC and Twitter and at Gmail and other stuff like that. Um, later today, I submitted a bunch of talks to everywhere I thought it's something interesting to share. And some crazy people at FOSTEM like, accepted them all. So I got a whole bunch of talks. Um, James, one moment. Yes. Can the next speaker set up? Yeah, if they want. Um, so I'm giving a whole bunch of talks uh, today and tomorrow. Some of them will sh I'll share some of the material. I'll definitely reuse all of my jokes, but there'll be different resources and different demos and stuff. So if you want to come check them out, look on the schedule, you'll find them. Um, also, uh, on the 4th in Ghent, there's Config Management Camp. So I give some like way harder talks. I'll be giving two talks there. Um, and on the 6th, there's a hackathon. It's completely free. You can just come. We're going to actually get hands-on with code if you want to play with this and you want some friendly pushes. Um, don't be shy. Check it out. Um, if you like this talk, make sure you go up to the FOSTEM organizers. They've rejected my main track talks every year for a few years now. And say, hey, this James guy, like, he was really dope. We should have him for a main track talk. So find them. And if you can go to the schedule page where you, on the FOSTEM website, there's actually this secret button, submit feedback, like under the schedule. Click on it and say, like, awesome, because that would really help. Um, I have free stickers. If you promise to use them on your laptops, I'll give you a sticker. Come up at the end. And happy to give you one. Uh, this is just some dumb jokes. Thank you very much. So I've got about four minutes for questions um, and or stickers. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll uh, you know, unplug this. Anybody have a question? Don't be shy. Uh, gentleman over here first. Yeah? Go ahead. Louder. You get one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Let me answer your first question. So um, can we use reusing code? Can we reuse existing code? We actually, not me, but this gentleman, Felix, who will also be presenting at Config Management Camp. Um, you can actually, um, we wrote a compiler that, or partially reusing some puppet code that takes existing puppet code and runs it on our engine. And he does some really fancy stuff with this. Personally, I think ultimately you've got to use new code. There's only so much you'll want to reuse. But for migration and for a lot of use cases, this actually works surprisingly well. Um, your second question about, like, at the border, how can you guarantee stuff? I think that sounds like a longer conversation, but come up and ask me after. I'll be in the hall for a bit. Uh, gentleman over here. Yeah. So the way you inter we interact with the host, the um, question was just about how you actually interact with the host, is with the resource API. And the resources that we implement are many different things. There are files. There are services, like a system D service you can start or stop. We can create and start and stop VMs, as you saw, uh, end spawn containers. We can even ask an AWS server to start up in a container, um, and anything else you can imagine. Uh, well, we have a whole bunch of core resources, and you can add more very easily. So if you think of anything you wanted to manage, anything you wanted to do or poke at declaratively, uh, the resource API is really easy to, to write. And uh, yeah. Any other questions? Got uh, time for, I think, one more question. One minute. Yeah, quickly. Yes, we have all sorts of data structures. They're all implemented in Golang. And all the code is 100% open source. So I have to go. I'll be in the hall if you have any more questions and you want a sticker. If not, just find me during the conference. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much.